Sometimes it's hard to gauge the mood of a crowd, but I want to share this with you. I hope you're ready this morning, because I have been excited about today. The Lord has put a message on my heart that, uh, that I just love to not only put together, but it spoke to me in a very powerful way about Jesus being in the midst of all things, all the circumstances, trials, tribulation, the joys, everything. Jesus is right there. And it blessed my heart tremendously. So I hope that uh, you are prepared. The title of the message is Successful Living in Spite of Circumstances. Most of us, I think, would love to know how to do this. How, how can we live successfully in this life in spite of our circumstances, in spite of the situations in which we find ourselves from time to time? I, I think that maybe we could learn something from Vern and Jed. You see, Vern and Jed were backwoods kind of people. And they, where they lived at, there were some uh, uh, ranches, and uh, the wolves had gone crazy. They were just attacking all the livestock and, and creating havoc. And this got so bad that the state stepped in and, and offered a bounty on wolves. They, gave, they were going to get $5,000 for every wolf. Well, Jed and Vern, they, they saw, saw stars in their eyes, and so they decided they were going to go in the wolf hunting business. So they went and got all the equipment that they felt like they needed and got all their stuff together. And early one morning, they sent out to go wolf hunting. Well, they were traveling up in the mountains. They were hunting all day and even uh, into the evening a little bit. And finally, they decided to settle down and make a camp for the night and get some rest. And they, they happened to pitch their tent by a flowing stream, very beautiful surroundings, very picturesque. And they had a roaring campfire going. And as they, they lied down to get their rest for the night, oh, uh, oh, Jed woke up about four in the morning. And there was enough of a fire still left that he saw circling the camp 30 or 40 wolves. And there was enough light that he could see the blood lust in their eyes. And he could see the very whites of their razor-sharp teeth as they were looking at Jed and Vern. He could also tell by their body posture and by the growls coming forth that they were about ready to pounce on those two men. And he didn't let that sway him. He grinned and he reached over and he nudged old Vern. He said, Vern, wake up, wake up. We're about to be rich. <laughs> that is successful living in spite of the circumstances. Would you turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 14? Matthew chapter 14. What we're going to see here in the passage that we'll look at is we're going to see the disciples, and especially Peter, they're going to learn something. They're going to learn how to live successfully in spite of their current situation, whatever uh, circumstances come their way. Jesus is going to teach them this. As you're turning to Matthew chapter 14, I want to let you know that a couple chapters earlier, chapter 8 in Matthew, we have a situation that is almost identical that we'll find in chapter 14. And in chapter 8, you may recall this, uh, the disciples and Jesus were on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, and the winds were just tossing the boat to and fro as a raging storm, and they were fearful of their life. And, and those of, of you, like myself, that are not used to being out on water, you know, if it just tips a little bit, you're going to get pretty nervous. But you see, these guys, at least some of them, were fishermen. They were used to being in these sorts of situations, and yet they were fearful. That gives you an idea how, how hard this storm must have been. And yet, Jesus, I don't know how in the world he did this, he was sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And they got so scared, so nervous, so concerned, that they woke Jesus up. And Jesus, when he got up, he calmed the storm. What we're going to find here in Matthew chapter 14 is a similar situation. They are on the Sea of Galilee, and a storm is raging and going on. If you'll look in Matthew 14, let's read this morning verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. If you'll pardon me, I need to sort of catch you up here. What's happened in the passage preceding this is that Jesus had just fed the multitude. You, you remember that? He fed the 5,000 with the, with the bread and the fish. And when this was completed, we now pick up where he sends the multitude away. He puts his disciples in a boat and says, go to the other side. Let's pick up in verse 23. And when Jesus had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. 
and they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, for it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered Jesus and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Would you join me in prayer? God, as we come to your throne of grace, we acknowledge, recognize, in fact, we lift it up that you truly are the Son of God, Jesus our Savior. And Lord, as you were teaching your disciples and teaching Peter with this incident, with this circumstance, I pray you'll teach us to draw closer to you, to trust in you. For we ask it in your precious name. Amen. Now, successful living, folks, is based on Jesus Christ. For there can be no success, that is, there can be no eternal success apart from Jesus Christ. It can't happen. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we, how can you and how can I live a fruitful life? How can we live a life that is meaningful, that is successful, when tragedy <laughs> comes our way, when trials and tribulation are a part of our life, even failure? as a part of our life. How can we live successfully in spite of these things? Well, the answer is that you and I can overcome. That is, we can rise above our circumstances if our life is based on Jesus Christ and letting Him handle the situation. I would invite you, if you have your bulletins with you, to open up and look at the outline. One of the things that I am going to start doing beginning this morning and, and from now on is in the bulletins. As you have the outline, I am going to attempt to make those outlines interactive. See, I believe that they are of no value to you unless you are able to interact, unless God can use it to teach you something, not only in your mind, but in your heart. And as you look at your bulletins, you will notice a series of questions that are very personal questions. And I would ask you to let God lead you through the power of His Holy Spirit to answer those questions and see how He might make a difference in your life. You can live successfully because Jesus is with you in the middle of your disaster. Let me say that again. You can live successfully because Jesus is with you in the middle of your disaster. Let's look at, at the disciples in verses 22 and following. It says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples go into the boat and go on the other side. And verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountains by himself to pray. Now, you have to envision this in your mind. He sends the disciples into the boat on the Sea of Galilee. He goes up to the mountain by himself. He wants to be with the Father in prayer. He wants to, to, to grow in his relationship. He wants to spend time uh, with God. And so he's alone there, verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Do you see what's happening here? A disaster comes. A storm is now upon the, the disciples. And they are fe fearful. They are scared. They don't know what to do. You would think that they would, at this point, be comfortable with this uh, circumstance because they just experienced it. But how many of us, when we're in the middle of a disaster, even though we've been through some other kind of disaster, do we get comfortable with it? No, we don't. And this is where the disciples found themselves, in the middle of a disaster. And verse 25 says, Now in the fourth watch, which is 3 a.m. in the morning, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Let me see if I can do this. A storm comes. They're in the boat, and it's being whipped about, and they're getting afraid. They're nervous. They have no idea. And guess who they're looking for? They're looking for Jesus. But when a storm is going on and Jesus is up on the mountain, they can't see him. And because he's not right in front of them, they assume he's not nowhere to be found, that he's not there. <coughs> How many of us get in the middle of a disaster and we're looking around for Jesus and we don't see Him? But did you catch that passage? Jesus was up on the mountain. Jesus saw everything that was going on. Just because we can't see Him doesn't mean He's not there. Amen? Jesus saw what was going on. What does the verse say that He did? He left the mountain and He walked out to where they were. Jesus was in the middle 
of their disaster. Just as Jesus is in the middle of your disaster, if you're experiencing one now, if a storm is part of your life, if, if money is a problem, if finances are a problem in your life, if a job is part of the problem, you don't have a job or you need a better one or a different one. Maybe you have a relationship with a spouse or a child or maybe a child to a parent or maybe a church member to a church member. There's some kind of relationship in your life that's not like it ought to be, like you want it to be, and, and you feel like a disaster, a storm is upon you. You need to know that Jesus sees what's going on. And not only does he see it, he's in the middle of it. He's right there. And I know that there are times when you feel like he's not there because you can't see him right in front of you. But trust me, Jesus is there. He sees where you're at. He sees the difficulty, the circumstances that you're in, and he's right in the middle of it. There was a guy who got shipwrecked, and if that wasn't bad enough, he got shipwrecked on a deserted island. And uh, he was only able to salvage a few of his personal effects, a few of his personal belongings, like some pictures and some things like that. And so the first thing he sets out to do on this island is to build a hut so that he could protect himself from the sun and the rain and those kinds of things. And so he builds this hut. When he gets through building this hut, he puts his personal belongings in there. And then every day he would go to the shoreline and walk up and down that shoreline because he wanted to search, look out for any uh, ship that might come to save him or rescue him. Well, this went on for some time. One night as the sun was setting and starting to get dark, he goes back to his hut. Much to his horror, he finds his hut is on fire. A roaring, blazing fire is consuming his hut and everything that's in it. He tries frantically to put the fire out, but he can't. And it burns everything to the ground. Uh, his hut and all of his personal belongings, everything now is burned up in smoke. Can you imagine the guy seeing this happen, wondering, God, where are you? Why aren't you here? Why are you letting this happen to me? God, I don't see you in this situation. You're not right in front of me. God, where are you? Can you imagine that happening? I think some of us do the same thing. Well, he has no choice. He goes back to the shoreline. He lays down to try to get some rest for the night. He's awoken early the next morning by a commotion. And as he looks up, he sees rescuers coming towards him. And the first man that gets to him says, We saw your smoke signal and we came to save you. God has the situation under control. What seems like hopelessness, what seems like God is nowhere to be found, He is right in the middle of it for His glory and for you as well. Jesus is with you in the middle of your disaster, in the middle of your storm. Secondly, you can live successfully because Jesus is with you in the middle of your disappointment. He is with you in the middle of your disappointment. If you'll look with me in verse 26 and following, it says, And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were troubled. They were saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, for it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered Jesus and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I love that. Can you imagine? He gets out of the boat, which is no small feat in itself. So he's got the land in the water to some degree with some weight and some force. And yet he's walking on the water. You see, he is on the mountaintop. What an experience that would be. A miracle is being performed. He's walking on water. Well, folks, sometimes we are on the mountaintop, and I want you to know, if you haven't already figured out, it can change just like that. I mean, in a moment's notice, it can change. Now, sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. In one verse, we have a life-changing circumstance happen. Look with me in verse 30. However, when Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and begins to sink, and he cries out, saying, Lord, save me. Do you see how he went from the, from the mountaintop to the valley in a twinkling of an eye? He was beginning to sink. Can you imagine what Peter must have felt like at that time? Can't you imagine he was disappointed? I can. Jesus told him he could do it. And he actually did do it for a little while until he took his eyes off of Christ 
And he started looking around to a circumstance, a situation. He forgot to keep looking at Christ. And he began to sink. I can imagine his disappointment. I can imagine his frustration. I can imagine that Peter very much felt like a failure at that time. How many of us, even maybe this morning, feel the same way? How many of us have arrived here to worship this morning and we feel like a failure? We have disappointment in our lives. Maybe we're clinging to something that's happened in the past, a failure or a disappointment or something that didn't go our way, and we're clinging to that. It may be that you're experiencing it right now. It's something in your life that's happening right now. And you very much can identify with Peter this sense of disappointment, this sense of failure. I would gather to say that some of us have even been disappointed, have been angry at God from time to time. God, why did you allow that to happen? It's possible that Peter could have wondered that. Lord, you're right there. Why did you let me sink? So our disappointment could be at ourselves. It could be at someone else. It could even be at God. And yet, this passage tells us very clearly that Jesus is there. He's in the middle of our disappointments, just as he was with Peter. For Peter cried out to the Lord, searching him, looking for him. I am reminded of a man by the name of John Payton. He was a seminary student in England some years ago. And when he graduated... The Lord wanted him to become a missionary, and he called him to a particular island called the New Hebrides Island. Well, John never heard of such a place. So he looks up this place on a, on a map, and he sees where it's located, some distance from England. And as he begins to research this island, he discovers it's a small island, not a whole lot of people there, mainly natives. But then one thing really jumps out at old John. The natives are cannibals. How would you like to go there? I know what, I'd certainly question God two or three times. And maybe John did the same thing. But at some point he realized that's where God wanted him. Now John was newly married. Not only is it a struggle to go to a place like this, on your own, you're bringing a bride with you. He's going to be obedient, he loves the Lord, wants to serve him, so he goes to this island. Now folks, it's not like America where you can put a sign out here and says we're going to worship at 11 o'clock and at 7. Y'all come. Can't do that. He's got to learn their language. He's got to learn their customs. He's got to be, begin to interact with them. And this takes years and years and years. Well, he was there for a little over a year when his wife had their first baby. What should have been a time of joy turned into a disaster. For that baby contracted some kind of tropical disease, and the baby died seven days after its birth. Now, to make matters worse, the baby passed that on to the mother. The mother died two days later. Can you imagine John's frustration? Can you imagine his disappointment? Can you imagine his anger? God, you sent me here. I'm here because of you. I love you. I worship you. I'm serving you. Why? How could this happen to me? What have I done to deserve this? Some of us may have felt that way. Maybe some of us feel that way now. God, where are you at? Bearing two loved ones in a matter of days. You remember where he's at? He's on an island with cannibals. He lays on their grave, physically lays on their grave for three days to make sure that those graves are not dug up. I think most of us, myself included, would have left the island. Said, forget it. But John didn't. In spite of his frustration, in spite of his disappointment, uh, anger, those kinds of emotions that surely he had, he was convinced that God wanted him there. He didn't understand his situation. He didn't understand what God was doing. Many times we don't understand. God says, how can a man know the ways of God? We can't. But do we trust Him? Can we say, God, I don't know what you're doing. don't have a clue. doesn't make sense to me. But I trust you. And I know that your will is going to be done. That was the attitude John had, and he stayed there. Well, shortly after this, one of the uh, members of the tribe there got kicked out. I don't know why, but he got kicked out. He was ostracized. He could no longer be a part of the the group there, the tribe. So he has no one to talk to, no one to fellowship with. So he becomes friends with John. They begin to share with one another. 
and he begins to share with John the language and the customs so that John can relate to the, to the natives there. Thirty-five years later, after this tragic incident, here's what John writes in his journal. He says, I do not know a single native on this island that has not claimed Jesus as their Savior. God's will was being done the whole time. Jesus Christ was right in the middle of the disaster. John cling to him, cling to in faith and in love and in the promises of God's word. And I want you to know this morning, he is with you. In the middle of your disappointments, when you feel like he's far, far away, he is with you. He loves you. And his will is being done. Finally, you can live successfully because Jesus is with you in the middle of your deliverance. Jesus is with you in the middle of your deliverance. If you look with me in verses 30, uh, 30 and following, it says, But when uh, Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Let me pause a moment here. Now, isn't it interesting that he didn't turn around and say, Hey, John, James, or one of you guys in the boat, come out here and get me quick. Isn't it interesting that he didn't call out to his mom or his dad? Isn't it interesting that he didn't begin to swim back to the boat? Isn't it interesting that he didn't try to solve it himself? He clinged to his only source of deliverance. He said, Jesus, save me. When we are in the middle of a raging storm, when we have disappointment facing us, it's okay to look for fellowship. It's okay to go to people. But our source and our strength must be in Christ. We too must reach out our hand and say, Lord, save me. Deliver me from this circumstance. Praise God. Verse 31. You know, Jesus didn't wait. Jesus didn't go, let me think about that. Jesus didn't say, let me check with God on that deal. He didn't say, well, because, you know, uh, I think you might learn something more. I'll just wait a little while. There's a very key word here we need to pick up on in verse 31. Jesus immediately. You know, when you call out to Christ, you know how fast he responds just like that? Jesus responds immediately, just as he did with Peter. He said immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and he caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, I want to address this verse because I think some people have it wrong. Some people would look at this verse and assume that Jesus said, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I do. I really do. But you know what? I don't believe Jesus said it that way. I want to tell you the way I think Jesus said that. I think he looked at John with all the love that God has. And he said, did you doubt? You see, I think it hurt Jesus. Peter, you saw me calm the storm just a little while ago. You saw me feed the 5,000. You, you've seen all the miracles that I've done. I'm going to go to the cross on your behalf. I'm going to give my life for you. That's how much I love you. Peter, please, please, Peter, don't ever doubt me. I'm always, all, you catch that word, always going to do what's best for you. Peter missed that. I wonder how many times we miss that. Jesus looks at us and goes, my child, my children, my church, please don't doubt me. Trust me. Have faith in me. I am in the middle of your deliverance. Verse 32, it says, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. <coughs> then those who were in the boat came and worshipped Jesus, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Revival broke out. Worship. Praising the Savior. Praising the Deliverer. Folks, if you haven't already figured this out, let me share this with you. The only Deliverer that you're ever going to know in your life is Jesus Christ. He is the only Deliverer that is offered unto this world, that is offered unto you. For it is He alone that provides deliverance. It is He alone that is the source of salvation. There is no other name given except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Chuck Colson tells about a prison that he went to in Brazil. Very amazed at this. He goes to this prison in, in Brazil to minister to the uh, inmates. 
And uh, this particular prison is run on Christian principles. Wish we'd do that here in our country. Okay, I just wondered. <clears throat> he goes there, and uh, the guy that opens the gate to let him in is one of the inmates. He's not just a typical inmate. He's a murderer, and he's got the keys to the place, and he's smiling. I don't know about you, but I'd be a little nervous at that point. But Chuck goes on in, and when he goes in, everywhere he walks in this prison, it's very clean. There is peace and joy among the prisoners. They're industrious. They're working. They're helping out. What a place of serenity. And he notices everywhere he goes, there are scriptures of, uh, of Psalms and Proverbs everywhere. He just, he just couldn't believe this. Well, he sees one isolated cell away from all the others. And Chuck goes, what's that cell? And the guide says, well, that is a, a torture cell. There are people that are put in there for the sole purpose of being tortured. And the guy said, but there's only one person in there. There's only been one person in there for quite a while, and uh, he's still there. Would you like to, to go see him? Chuck said, oh, okay, sure. So they go over to the cell. The guy unlocks it, kind of pushes the door a little bit, and Chuck kind of peers in to see what, who's in there. And let me share with you what he sees. He sees a crucifix. He sees Jesus Christ, a carving, a beautiful carving of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the guy looks straight at Chuck Colson and he says, he's doing the time for the rest of us. <laughs> he is your deliverer. He's my deliverer. Praise God for that. He is the Savior. Folks, if you want to live a successful life, one that doesn't depend on circumstances, it doesn't matter if you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. It doesn't matter if you're poor, beaten down, and broken, or somewhere in between. If you want to live a successful life, an eternally successful life, it must be based and founded on Jesus Christ and Him alone. Trusting in Him, you must lean on Him. Lean on the everlasting arms. You must receive Him. I want to close this morning by telling you another true story. It's about a group of people living successful lives in spite of their circumstances. I really want you to listen. This is a, a, just a tremendous true story, one that touched my heart very deeply. Chuck Colson tells us that this involves Chuck Colson once again. You see, Chuck is part of a prison fellowship. They go to prisons all over the world and minister to the inmates. I'm happy to say that we have folks here that do that. Praise God for those that go to the prisons and minister to those. He goes to this particular prison in Zambia. He said it was the worst prison he had ever been to. Now, folks, that's saying a lot. When you go to prisons, and especially third world prisons, to say it's the worst, I mean, that's terrible. I, I want to describe just some of the things for you that Chuck saw. He saw brutality. He saw horrors. He saw every kind of meanness, every kind of ungodly thing that you can imagine going on. No sanitation. It was a horrendous place. And he thought, surely, surely, it couldn't get any worse than this. But he was wrong. His guide said, would you like to see the secret inner prison that we have? And Chuck said, well, sure. Now, folks, God was involved in this because they never let anybody see that. And for some reason, and it's God, the guard said, okay, we'll let him see it. So they go to this little cell area. The, the cell area, this particular cell, is 15 by 40. To give you an idea how small it is, it's about three or four of our classrooms. It's not very big. They had 120 prisoners in there. It was so crammed, full of people, full of men, that they couldn't all lie down and go to sleep at the same time. They had to go in shifts. It was a metal structure in Africa, folks, where the temperatures soar way above 100 degrees. And they bake and roast inside this. They are forced to stay in there 23 hours a day. They're only allowed to come out one hour 
to walk and to exercise in a courtyard that is smaller than this sanctuary. Chuck goes to the door, and all he can see is the whites of their eyes. The door is opened up, and out comes this most horrific stench, unlike he'd ever smelt before in his life. He discovers that it's so bad that there's no bathroom facilities in there. They make the inmates use their food pants to go to the bathroom. You've got to wonder, where is God in this? How can God be involved in this circumstance? Where is God in this? And even beyond that, how in the world is Chuck going to talk to them about God? How can can Chuck tell them that God does truly love them in that situation? I want you to listen to what happened. The guide introduces Chuck to that group tells him that he's a Christian, that he ministers to inmates. Eighty of the 120 prisoners go to the back of the cell and they line up in four rows. And you know what happens? They begin singing Christian hymns. You know what? They were singing in four-part harmony. If I've ever read about a group of people that were living successful lives, In spite of their circumstances, it is that group. Oh, how I pray God would break us, would humble us to the point where we wouldn't be so obsessed about our own living conditions. We wouldn't be so obsessed about the things that are around us. The only thing that we would be obsessed with is Jesus Christ. You're living successfully and my living successfully is based on Jesus in our heart. He is with us in the middle of our disaster. He is with us in the middle of our disappointment. And He is with us in the middle of our deliverance. Would you bow your heads this morning?